We're because we don't have any visitors tonight from Portugal. Nobody here from Poland. It's just us. South Jersey. But hey, yeah. good to see the handful here. Hopefully, you're joining us online. And as always, live from Burbank, California. Oh my um, we're turning to number two forty-six. He will carry you. And this song kind of goes all over the place. Um, those of you who remember from the '80s, you won't have a problem with it. But you do the the beginning of the song twice, and then you do the refrain oh, twice. Man. And then you do the come unto me, and then you go back and do the first page and the correct refrain twice and twice. So it's two times, two times, he will come come to me, and then two times and two times. Right, Carol? All right. Yeah. Right, that's it. Sure. That didn't sound very musical, but it's right. Here we go. <laughs> there is no problem to me, I cannot solve it. There is no mountain to tall. He cannot move it. There is no storm to dark. God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow to deep. He cannot do it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know my brother that he carry you. <laughs> if he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know my sister that he will carry you. He said, come unto me, all who are weary.
singing there. The first time I heard There is a River was on a Danny Gaither album. Danny Gaither. Hello. Hey there. Tonight my missionary moment update is twofold and for two separate missionaries. Last week we had the blessing to hear from John and Dasha Abramovich, mm -hmm. but it was very fresh in Dasha's mind and she didn't want to share it, but her dad actually passed away a week and a half ago while she was oh, here man. in the United States. And while her siblings were there, they actually had the funeral without her. So she's going back in two weeks, very sad, and said, it will not be mm. like home. So if you could just lift up Dasha, mm. I would really appreciate it. Mm. Also, last week, John shared about their friend, Pastor Timo. And he was the pastor in the Ukraine that um, John was sharing about how he drove, like, I think for 11 hours one day to get food yeah, over yeah, to yeah. Ukraine. Um, and he sent an update to Dasha, who forwarded it to me, and it was on Sunday night. He wrote, today is May, 20, May 22nd, the 88th day on the attack on the Ukraine. As they were sitting in church in Buka, which is basically like a suburb of Kiev, on Sunday morning, air sirens were sounding over their church service. Um, they were very saddened to hear that, but they did not let it scare them away. And John actually asked us to specifically pray for this pastor and his church for that Sunday. And over 400 people attended the church service. Wow. Many of them do not know the Lord. They were just coming wow. for safe haven. And um, every single person who attended the service was able to get a box of food. If you were with your family, you could get one box for the family. And they got to hear the word of God. So John wow. and Dasha are praising the Lord for that. He said it was such an amazing answer to prayer and to continue to pray for them. Um, on another missionary front, Tom and Sandy Brown are missionaries to Oaxaca, Mexico, and they serve as part of Wycliffe Mission, but they've been doing about half of their year here in Lancaster. Um, they're planning to retire soon, so as their last hurrah, they're headed out to Oaxaca on June 7th oh. um, as kind of their last missions effort. And on June 11th, the Missions Church, which is her son-in-law's church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, are actually joining them in Oaxaca from June 11th to 20th to serve as a work team with them. The short-term missions team will be laying a tile floor in two churches, putting on a marriage seminar, and throwing a kids' outreach program hmm. two of the days that week. Um, so please be in prayer for this team and Tom and Sandy as they travel to serve. The Browns' current prayer requests are to continue to lift up the church in Oaxaca, the women's center that they've been part of for many years, and their safety and travels. Mm. So with this, I'm just going to close us in mm. this section. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, that we are able to meet each week without air sirens going off over our heads. I thank you, Lord, for this body of believers here in Maple Shade who seek to lift up those sharing your light. I thank you, Lord, that all believers, no matter where they are planted, are missionaries, in a sense, to your truth. Lord, I specifically ask that you are with Dasha as she misses her dad and gets to reunite with her family in two weeks. Please be with Pastor Timo as he tries to feed many people in the Ukraine, both physically and spiritually. Give him comfort in knowing that he is being lifted in prayer. Lord, please be with Tom and Sandy as they prepare their trip to Oaxaca and be with them as they help lead this short-term missions group. Lord, I just ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Christine. Well, um, if you're waiting, you're saying, this is typically the Bible trivia segment. It is. Pastor Greg, it was his birthday yesterday, I believe, right? Yes. Yes. Yesterday was Pastor Greg's birthday. So, he has given, he came up with birthday Bible trivia. But, remember what the song says, it's my party, I can miss it if I want to. And so he is not here with us tonight, but it's actually because it's my daughter, Hannah, flying in from Michigan. Not mine, his. He's picking up his daughter, Hannah, uh, at the airport. But he gave us trivia, and you know it's his, because it's on orange paper. And so... <laughs> 
Good old Pastor Greg, right? So we're going to be doing his trivia. Good to have a good amount of you online with us. Uh, we don't quite have the room packed like we did with the missionaries, but that's okay. I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad those of you who are here are here. So here we go. This is birthday party Bible trivia, again, by Pastor Greg, right? Number one, to which prophet does God say, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God said to this prophet, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were set apart, born, you were set apart. I appointed you a prophet of the nations. Yes, Carol. I think it's Jeremiah. It is Jeremiah. Well done. And so uh, if any, I don't see any answers online yet, but maybe your answers are going to come up slow or you're just... Not quite ready for that. I see the happy birthdays to Pastor Greg. Terrific. Jeremiah was the correct answer. All right. Again, remember, points are a thing in Pastor Greg's imagination. So I, I don't give out points, right? Here we go. Number two. It's Jeremiah. Good, Robbie. You got it right. Good to, good to have you on, Robbie. We'll be praying for you. Number two. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Jesus said this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the blank is blank. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the, what, fill in the blanks. Dave? Spirit, spirit is spirit. Spiritual birth. I, this morning I was... Uh, Mark Johnson, I thank God for him and his, he's a teacher at Haddon Heights High School and he had me in 7.30 this morning for his Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, FCA program before school starts and was there with some of those high schoolers and just telling them, I remember my spiritual birth. I would look at it, some of them saying, I was your age, right? As a, as a teenager, when that which was born of the flesh, Vince McDonald, by God's grace, was born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And that is the uh, correct answer. I see several of you got that. Craig and Chris and Twistle, Robbie, Nancy, good. Number three, on the third day, which was Blank's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. On the third day, which was this person's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. Bill? Pharaoh, Pharaoh it is. Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Right, Pharaoh. That was a uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, I'm, did Don Hill do that one? Where, where did I first hear that? Well, that was been around for a while, right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh. What's that? Yeah. All right. Good. And uh, here we go. Number four. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to blank. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. What did they do? He says, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. celebrate. Good times. Come on. It's a celebration, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes, they began to celebrate. Indeed. Happy birthday. But this one was lost and is found. That sense of, boy, the, a new birth for the prodigal son, right? Yes, party indeed is what it was. Number five. As a matter of fact, he even has it here in the New Living Translation. It says the party began. They began to celebrate a party. So, Robbie, you get that credit for saying party, right? Number five. And you shall eat it as barley blank, baking it in their sight on Human dung. Hmm. Number five, and you shall eat it as barley blank, birthday party, baking it 
on their sight on human dumb. Barley what? Tasty cakes. Yes. Oh, no. Tasty cakes. Barley. There was the crimpet. There was the barley cake. No. <laughs> You're exactly right. Cake. It's that famous biblical person said, let them eat cake. Actually, that was what? Marie Antoinette? Yeah, okay. Anyhow. Anyhow. Number six. For the blank and the calling of God are irrevocable. Out of Romans. For the blank and the calling of God are irrevocable. Bill? Yes. Gifts. Good. I thought that was going to be a tougher one. For the gifts and the calling of God, irrevocable. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Good job, you folks coming in so far. Some of you got the cakes and whatnot. So number seven, the Lord appeared to him. Again, if you're just joining us, this is birthday trivia from Pastor Greg. The Lord appeared to him because it was his birthday yesterday. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the blank of the merrymakers. Get the tambourines and go forth in the what? Of the merrymakers. Dave. Yeah. Dance. That's right. Dance to uh, celebrate. Dance for your birthday. I guess, I don't know. I guess they gave Greg a birthday dance. <laughs> you should see Greg dance around the office. Pastor Greg, he, he doesn't show you guys, but oh, the pirouettes. And, uh, he just, you'll see him doing the, the, the you know, the. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say the balsam, but that's not a dance. That's wood, isn't it? That's a tree or something. Anyhow, he does that. He does the balsam. No. Anyhow, he's not here, right? All right, number eight. Number eight. As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of blank and gladness, days for sending gifts of blank to one another and gifts to the poor. Both blanks are kind of connected, but they're different words. So that they should make them days of blank and gladness, days for sending gifts of what to one another and gifts to the poor. At a birthday celebration anybody online come up with they, they'd be days of what and gladness and days for sending gifts of something and what they're sending is related to the first thing that they're doing at parties we well, that, that, that we do that that would be a good one but that's not it Ooh. but we right. Well, gladness is is in there, but what's one of the things that we do that makes us glad sometimes? I said, Dave. Song. Song. That's a good one too. These are all good. It's so that they should make them days. Anybody online coming through yet? Make them days of blank and gladness. And that first thing that we can be doing is tied into sending gifts of what to one another? Feasting? Feasting and gifts of food. Yes. Greg was determined to have us. He was determined to have us hungry before we're done here. Feasting and food. Good guess. Nancy Joy. Some people guess that here. But it was feasting and food. And his last one. This is out of the book of Romans. Knowing this, oh, knowing this, that our blank blank was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Old man. Old man. Old man. 
Right, Greg calling himself an old man. I don't know about that. Greg, Pastor Greg is, he is exactly, he, he is almost to the day exactly the same right in between me and my son. You know, he, he's 13 years younger than me and 13 years older than Vince, but almost to the exact middle point of between our, our uh, ages. Anyhow, Brother Tom, come share a, an emphasis of prayer for us, and then I'll come back and look into God's Word. I don't need to promo Wednesday nights to these people or even the people online. But if I was, <laughs> if I was well, Sunday morning, I would say Vince's messages on Wednesday night are worth coming out for. I would say <laughs> that you're getting Sunday morning quality at Wednesday night prices. Oh, man. And there it is go. a bargain. And everybody's looking for bargains now. It is a bargain to come on Wednesday night. <laughs> Now, the uh, prayer emphasis tonight, because we're moving on from the Lord's Prayer, and I have things we're going to be praying for, for loving and being uni unity and holiness. And I think there's a key first for those things. And it comes from the epistle of J. Wright, chapter 1, verse 1. If J. you know J. Wright, <laughs> he's the coach of the Villanova, uh, he just retired just as coach of the Villanova men's basketball team. Very successful he uh, has won two championships, takes them to the final four, four times. And when they go, they have a week to practice. And there's all this media, all these young guys are thrust into the national spotlight uh, being interviewed. And uh, says, Jay Wright preaches unselfishness and humility to his players all the time. The team gets to the final four and the players are faced with doing the opposite for days leading up to the game. He says, a lot of what goes on here is not reality. You spend two-thirds of your day talking about yourself. He says, we teach these guys all the time, life is not about you. It's what you do for others. We talk about it all the time. Then we come here, and all you do is talk about yourself. <laughs> uh, he said, his time alone with his players is a chance to reinforce his beliefs amid the chaos of the tournament. We use the term... Be hungry and humble. I think it's a great challenge when you're at the Final Four. He's a wise man. And I think humility, humility is the key to so many things. It's the key to being able to love others, the key to being able to be part of the body of Christ and serving others, and uh, even the key to reaching holiness. These are the things that we're going to pray for. Uh, uh, there's a famous book. A lot of people, may have, you might have read, maybe somebody in this room, Rick Warren, wrote The Purpose Driven Life. Anybody read that? If you did, I wonder if you remember the first four words. The first four words of his book, the way he introduces it, it's not about you. Yeah. Those are the first four words of his book. And I find that fascinating. Um, humility. What humility does for us to, to, to tear down, uh, self, you know, not tearing down yourself, but the, the selfish, the pride, the wanting, uh, always looking out for, and saying, well, why is that person getting this? Or, it have, creeps into the church. And it's, a, it's this kind of thing. You can take self, and you can kind of beat it out like a fire with a rug or something. Beat it out. You know, have you ever had a fire that goes out and it relights itself? Mm. I've seen it before. It does. And I think that's the way self is, probably for our whole lives. You might beat it out for today, right? But then tomorrow it might relight itself, and you got to do it all again. So humility is something that I don't know anybody can say, I've conquered, I've, you know, pride and selfishness, and all. I've conquered it all. Uh, if you did, you probably did it for a day, maybe. Right? And if you're saying it, then right, of course you're not humble. But, uh, so I want to pray for us we want us to pray, this is the, the, the uh, emphasis, that we're going to pray, come before God and ask him to make us humble. Mm -hmm. Make us humble, and that will unlock some of these other things we're going to be praying for in the future weeks. So let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we do thank you so much for uh, your example. Philippians 2, 
talking about Jesus coming down, being equal with God, giving that up, come down to be a human, lower than the angels, and not just a human, uh, but a servant. And it says, even to the point of death. And not just death, but death on a cross. So that's uh, that's a, a lot of steps down he took for us, Lord, and, and an example uh, to follow. And I pray that we could have that perspective when we struggle with uh, uh, seeing others, uh, wanting to, to either feel uh, superior to them or, or wish that uh, we should have what they have, or uh, that we would recognize uh, what Jesus has done for us in humbling himself uh, in ways that uh, obviously we don't deserve uh, what he came down to do for us, Lord. And we just pray that we could have the, the, the proper perspective, putting others ahead of ourselves, as your word says, and being able to love and serve them because of that. So, Lord, just break us of our pride, break us of our Focus on self, even though it's just looking for comfort and convenience. Uh, recognizing that, no, we can be servants. We can, we can uh, get dirty. We can get down on our hands and knees. We can serve. We're not above anything, Lord. And we just pray that you, we would be, become servants in your hand because of our humility. Lord, please give us a big dose of that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Amen to that for sure. Man, good, 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 good word and good prayer. My brother Leo used to always joke, Have you read my book, The Ten Most Humble Men in the World and How I Trained the Other Nine? That was it was his classic, you know, obviously jerk joke that doesn't, you know, what wouldn't doesn't fit, right? But um I uh, I'm so grateful when they kind of redid the room behind, you know, right off of on the one side behind the piano. The, the, the our kind of praise team has a room there, and it's a room behind the organ where I can get sit and gather my thoughts on Sunday morning. And Christine very graciously gave over time and painted right there on the wall for a constant reminder, right? You know that 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 God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Don't step out there on the pulpit in pride. Step out with humility. And uh, such, a, such a prayer for us all. What a great prayer request. Well, we're going to continue in the Word tonight. And it's not as exciting maybe as Portugal. Or maybe it is. Because, <laughs> I mean, the Word is. But we're, we're jumping back in to Ezekiel, right? But here's the, what I want you to turn to first is Luke. Luke chapter 24. Uh, there, are, I know there are verses of scripture that I'll hit over and over and kind of say, this is one of those things that, and, and, and this is one of them. In Luke 24, because it's a key verse, it's a key reminder of what we refer to as the doctrine of progressive revelation. That God first began to reveal through creation, he revealed himself to, to you know, in, in personal ways and Ultimately, through Jesus, after the prophets, and then not only through the life of Christ, but then revealing further special revelation all the way through John, right, and the closing book. But in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, when Jesus has risen from the dead, and we read, and beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. But just think about that moment. Nobody had ever had the Son of God explained to them. All sorts of people in the Old Testament heard the prophets, knew the, knew the, the, the historical fact, but nobody ever up to that point, picture these apostles as their eyes are wide open. They, for the first time in God's revelation, Jesus puts it all together for them, how it points to him and how he fulfills it all. And uh, so in verse 44, he says to the disciples, 
These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I want to say to us, as we read Ezekiel tonight, as we jump back in and start reading some of Ezekiel, we're in chapter 7 tonight. Realize what a gift it is for us to be where we are, to have the complete revelation of God. So that when those who read Ezekiel, they were getting the message God had for them. But we get it in the context of God's full plan of salvation. We get it in the context of what the Apostle Paul says when he says, I didn't stop preaching to you the whole counsel of God, the whole purpose of God. And so I, I, as we look into Ezekiel 7, heavy chapter, but oh, the privilege for us to, to be people that, G, that who, we're, you know, in other words, we're the followers of the apostles, we're the followers of Christ, but the apostles went forward as witnesses and the apostle Paul and we know Ezekiel in the context of God's full revelation. And that's why we get to draw so much more upon it. So let me read the first paragraph of chapter 7 as, we're, as we are kind of doing that. I'm reading actually here uh, verses uh, 1 through verse uh, 9. Moreover, the paragraph could break before that, but anyhow. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying... And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end is coming on the four corners of the land. Now the end is upon you. And I shall send my anger against you. I shall judge you according to your ways. I shall bring all your abominations upon you. For my eye will have no pity on you, nor shall I spare you. But I shall bring your ways upon you, and your abominations will be among you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, unique disaster. Behold, it is coming. An end is coming. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Behold, it has come. Your doom has come to you. O inhabitant of the land. The time has come, the day is near, tumult rather than joyful shouting on the mountains. No birthday party, right? Now I will shortly pour out my wrath on you, spend my anger against you, judge you according to your ways, and bring on you all your abominations. My eye will show no pity. Think what we're reading here. Nor will I spare. I will repay you according to your ways while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I, the Lord, do the smiting. Hello to those of you joining in here. Yeah, what we read these verses and, and we take them just in the words as they're coming to Ezekiel, the people who are reading. Think about what's hitting them. First impact, an end. It's over. Abruptness, right? Wow. Tom can testify with me. There were times in our house. That's it. Give it to me. My dad would say, that's it. You, give me the toy. And it was gone. We, whether it was a Super Bowl or something, I told you not to throw it. That's it. You're done with it. And boom, it was gone. You were separated from it. And, and it went into his room, into that. Holy of the holies, you weren't allowed to go into that section and, and never open the Ark of the Covenant, that top drawer, unless he wasn't home. And, and, and no, and, and, and <laughs> but if I, I said before, if you open that drawer and you took out the toy, you need to make sure you put it back exactly where you got it from. My dad would have a sense of knowing, right? He knew, you know, right? Anyhow, but that sense, of, I can remember that sense of, huh? abruptness. That's it. You're done with it. I told you, and you're done. God's saying an end. Verse 2, end. Verse 3, the end. Verse 6, an end. The words of what? Verse 5, disaster. Verse 7, doom. Wow. 
that God's word is what? It's sure. It's sure. In the full context of God's revelation, sometimes someone might pick up this and say, if they're just new, does that mean I can't be forgiven? It sounds like he's saying they can't be forgiven. And God is saying to them, that's it. It's done. It's too late. The judgment is coming. But that's the beauty of having the full revelation of God. We can read this and know that as long as we have breath, he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We put Ezekiel within the context of the full words of God. But what it's supposed to bring, right? It is supposed to cause us some real personal conviction to read God saying, an end, it could come, right? As, as the writer to the Hebrews says in, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, speaking about the incredible sacrifice of Christ and taking the judgment for us. But what does the verse say, right? We know it. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and then comes, after this comes judgment. So when I read Ezekiel, it's a sobering reminder, personal conviction. But it's also what? A sobering reminder of personal comfort. Now, how do I mean that? We're going to be talking this Sunday about our how our hearts should not be, oh, I can't wait till some of these lousy unbelievers get what's coming to them. That should not be the, the, the posture of our heart. Humility, compassion. But it's okay to have that comfort that the psalmist talks about in Psalm 73, right? When he's saying, I'm seeing the wicked getting away with so many things. I'm seeing wicked people that are, that are, are, are getting richer and richer and they're, 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 they're abusing others and injustice. But what does he finally say? He says, I pondered this, Psalm 73, and verse 16. It was troublesome until I came into the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived their end. That there is some comfort when we read Ezekiel and we say, God saying, an end. That's it. That it's a reminder to us, particularly when we think about, I'm not, you know, not, Listen, I'm talking more when we think about some of our brothers and sisters in this world who are under horrendous persecution and suffering. Horrendous. We studied Revelation and we looked ahead at some of those martyrs saying, Lord, how long until this reminds us, God says an end is coming. There will be an end to injustice. There will be an end to those who think that they are not accountable to God. And so we read this Ezekiel, and as we're reading it, what does he say? End. It's coming. Boy, the words that we read there in that paragraph, my eye has no pity. When I think about the, the, the eye of God and how it's used in Scripture, and like Deuteronomy chapter 32 Right in Deuteronomy chapter 32, back in that, remember it's the song of Moses that I quoted this past Sunday. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10, Moses is singing, he found him in a desert land. He, he's talking about God finding, you know, people, the people of Israel. And in the howling waste of a wilderness, he encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Some translations say apple, but the pupil of his eye, that, that delicateness to be, you know, in God's eye. Jesus uses uh, that, that picture. Of course, it inspired a song, right? But in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. What? Seeing them. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are more value than many sparrows in that song. 
I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. We're so used to in scripture, the eye of God. Oh, thank God that your eye is on me. And yet here God says, listen, that's it. My eye is going to have no pity for you. None. Harsh words for the people of Israel because they what? Have just ignored him. No detour, no turnaround. The road ahead ends with judgment. Look at the next paragraph, just a couple verses uh, in here. Verse, uh, let's go with verse 10. Behold the day, behold it is coming. Your doom has gone forth. The rod has budded. Arrogance has blossomed. Violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain. None of their multitude, none of their wealth, nor anything eminent among them. The time has come. The day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is against all their multitude. Indeed, the seller will not regain what he sold as long as they both live, for the vision regarding all their multitude will not be averted, nor will any of them maintain his life by his iniquity. Again, we have the God of all creation saying to his people, judgment is coming, it's sure, and he gives them some pictures. The rod has budded, right? Well, in other words, the time has come. Years ago, well, well, over 45 years ago, we would go on, I forget which Monday night, well, it was the third Monday night, one of the Monday, third, Mon third Monday night of the month, the Holiday Skating Center for Teen Discovery Skating. I remember being there, you know, in, in my, my, you know, you know, particularly my early high school years and me and some others doing our little roller derby or getting you know, whistled by. George Klein, by the way, was old enough to be our referee. I remember this smooth skater. It was George Klein. Oh, man. He was at, at him backwards skating, whistling. You, sit down for five minutes. You know. But at the end of Teen Discovery Skating, you know, maybe it went. I'm telling I like this girl. When you would hear... Our day will come. That was the final skate. You better ask her now. If you don't ask her now, her friends are going to be saying on the bus, why didn't you ask her? You know? and, uh, so I'd go over to her, would you like to skate? <laughs> Our day will come. And that was the end. It was the end. It was the finish, the final, the final skate, right? Here it is. It's not a beautiful thing. It's budded. It's a picture of what? Nebuchadnezzar is ready. He's ready. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And everyone's going to be impacted. What do you say there? Doesn't matter if you're the buyer or the seller. Doesn't matter whether you're walking away with money or you're walking away with product. If you're going, man, I got a great deal. Or you're... None of you are going to get to enjoy it. That's what he's saying. None of you, the buyer, the seller, you're losing everything. Hmm. Wow. Whew. Verse 14, they have blown the trumpet and made everything ready, but no one is going to the battle. For my wrath is against all their multitude. The sword is outside. The plague and the famine are within. He who is in the field will die by the sword. Famine and the plague will also consume those in the city. Even when their survivors escape, they will be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, each over his own iniquity. All hands will hang limp. All knees will become like water. And they will gird themselves with sackcloth and shuddering will overwhelm them and shame will be on all faces, baldness on all their heads. They shall fling their silver into the streets and their gold <laughs> shall become an abhorrent thing. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their appetite, nor can they fill their stomachs for their iniquity has become an occasion of stumbling. Have you ever been talking to someone who's not a believer, their eyes haven't been open? You're trying to convince them of the gospel. And they, they, they kind of almost verbalize, I'll take my chances. And the reminder here is the sureness of God's word. Every, everybody. 
Everybody will fall under judgment apart from those whose judgment has been paid by Jesus. They've come, placed themselves under his care. Everybody. And boy, this is sobering words that we're reading, right? Again, some pictures. The trumpet sounds. Nobody, nobody out there in the battlefield. I say this in our day and age today of social media. People, it's, I believe it's another area where people feel, you know, they can put something on social media and there's going to be a group of people that like it and defend them. And, and there's this sense of, you, you know, rallying people around you. It's just not going to happen. There is going to be no rally against the judgment of God. It's just not going to happen. It's a picture here. They're throwing their, their gold and silver into the streets because it's worthless. I was just thinking the other day, I was walking and I saw a dime in the street. I stopped, bent over, picked it up. I can remember, you know, as a kid, serving my papers or something, seeing a dime. Oh, it was like, wow. I mean, obviously a dime, it did more back then, particularly when I, I didn't, you know, a dime. And they're going to be throwing gold and silver in the streets because it's 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 like trash. It's worthless, is the point, right? What do we read in verse? Is uh, where did I leave off? Did I leave off? Oh, I left off. I, I shouldn't have. But anyhow, I cut the paragraph. Anyhow, and they transformed the beauty of his ornaments into pride. And they made the images of their abominations and their detestable things with it. Therefore, I will make it an abhorrent thing to them. This is, those are those that are in captivity and think they're going back to the temple in Jerusalem. Forget it. It's all getting, I shall give it into the hands of the foreigners as plunder to the wicked of the earth as spoil and they will profane it. I shall also turn my face from them and they will profane my secret place. Then robbers will enter and profane it. Verse 23, the last paragraph. Make the chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. Therefore I shall bring the worst of the nations, and they will possess their houses. I shall also make the pride of the strong ones cease. Their holy places will be profaned. When anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Disaster will come upon disaster. Rumor will be added to rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will be lost from the priest and counsel from the elders. This is just such a sad. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with horror. The hands of the people of the land will tremble. According to their conduct, I shall deal with them. And by their judgments, I shall judge them. And they will know that I am the Lord. Think of that verse of scripture. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Three times, he says, right? Verse four, back in verse four, he said, um, you will, then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse nine, he said, then you will know that I, the Lord, do the smiting. And now what does he say? And they will know that I am the Lord. God's word is sure. Now see, we can read that in Ezekiel. We can find ourselves, hopefully, reminded, oh, this world around us, it's not an intimidating world. It's a world that their, their judgment is sure. And you need to see that about what's what they're facing. Look past the arrogance. Look past the mistreatment and see individuals whose judgment is sure. But in the full context of God's word, right, the principle that we draw out of Ezekiel for us is God's word is sure. So it's sure for us. When we read 1 John 5, 13, that says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That same sureness of Ezekiel 7 saying, end, it's coming, know this. It's over, doom, disaster, guaranteed. That same sureness is saying to me, no end. 
The end is never coming. Eternal life. Fellowship with God. Fellowship in heaven. Party and sureness. It's a just as firm. The firm sureness of God. What else is sure? Security. I was, somebody drove by me the other day and I loved it. Verse on the back of their window was Romans 8, 38 and 39. Right? Neither height nor depth nor angels, prince, prince. Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. I was in Haddon Heights High School this morning, as I said. I'm talking to the high schoolers about truly that the confidence that it can empower you with. I said, I walked down the hallway and I saw a big, you know, they have a big banner. No bullying zone or whatever, you know. And I said to them, you can put up all the banners you want. I'm sure there's some bullying that goes on in here. And I said, but know this, the biggest bully in the world can't do anything to, to change your eternal destiny. Nothing. They're powerless. Whatever you consider the biggest bully in the world. Why? Because God's word is sure. Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. What else is sure? What the, the service for Christ that you're involved in. I think Greg quoted it. Pastor Greg quoted it. Right? Be steadfast and movable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your labor is not in vain. God sees it. We got started tonight. Handful of us compared to last, you know, last week. Reminded me of one of those winter nights when I was first the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in uh, Cherry Hill. And our evening service was at 7 o'clock. And uh, 7 o'clock came and nobody was there. And I was like, all right. And Sodom boy, boy, if it just gets to 7.05, 7.05, I'm going home. I'm going home 705, lived right down the street in the parsonage. And I, and I remember that verse coming to me. Vince, be steadfast and movable, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the, in the Lord. This peace came over me in about 707. This old, nice, wonderful couple there with the Lord, Will and Ruth Brink, came in. Hello, Pastor. We made it. I said, hey, good, good to have you here. You know, let's, let's worship the Lord together, right? But it's so sure. It's so sure. Let's pray. Father, thank you. The surety of Ezekiel, the judgment, it's coming. Give us a heart for the lost. But Lord, we get to see it in the context of all your revelation. And it shows us of the surety of God's word. What is so rock solid for us. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Any prayer requests that we may have, if you're, I see some of you that Carolina, I don't know if you're still watching Carolina Meredith, but if you are, we miss you guys and we love you. I saw you were on here. So many uh, have uh, been, been, been online with us. We've got different prayer requests here that we have been praying for some updates. Robbie Sullivan, I know you're watching us. We're praying for Robbie. Robbie uh, is still has needs to get some more tests done to understand why was it that she was losing blood internally. And they gave her, obviously, when she was in the hospital, they gave her at, at blood. And But just be praying for God's peace around Robbie as she waits uh, to find some answers to that. Um, we want to be praying the memorial service for Keith Dennis, his mother, for Doris Dennis, a dear servant here in our church for many years in the past, uh, this coming Saturday, be keeping them in prayer. Um, we have highlighted as well, uh, the, um, Karen Lococo, as we say, <laughs> I keep feeling like I'm saying that wrong. Lococo, Lococo. Yeah. And, and praying her back from surgery. The Ritter family is the family whose funeral I spoke at Monday, their 24-year-old son. So I appreciate your continued prayers for them. And as I kind of uh, seek to follow up and minister to them. Praising the Lord, Bill Luter's sister is doing much better or coming along. And we're 
We thank God for that. We thank God that Joy Massimilla's biopsies were negative. We thank God for Chris Bracken that there was no cancer, some more chemo treatments, but gaining strength. Bob Henry's brother, we've been praying for, excuse me, Bob Henry, Tom Henry's brother, we're, his tumor has shrunk. We're praising the Lord for that. So the, the Lord has answered some of the prayers as, as we've desired to see them answered. We always know he's at work, but we praise God for that. Uh, does anybody have a prayer request here tonight you want us to remember as I close us in prayer? We want to be praying uh, for our vacation Bible school. Dave. We see these nurses, some of my friends in other schools are nurses that because of the weirdness of COVID and last year, post-COVID, but, you know, some online, some in person and stuff, there are a lot of children that are really struggling academically, uh, especially children who were learning to read and never really quite got it. Um, and there were some kids this week, I was trying to test people, and there were individuals where I had to read the questions to them because they, they couldn't. Wow. So just that... that Kids can get the help that they need. Um, if parents are willing to help find them, maybe tutors or whatever. Uh, and, and teachers are working hard trying to get caught up from all that they lost with being online for so long. And then okay. Missing. Yeah. For the kids. Be praying for them. And as I said, along with that, for our vacation Bible school, uh, that it would be a meaningful, uh, meaningful, meaningful time. Be praying for Keely. There, she's away right now, but. As she comes back and kind of gets into some things, partly with VBS, but partly with the idea of what children's ministry that she like kind of under her new leadership as 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 children's ministry that we might start up in the fall and, and just what God would have for us uh, for that. So be praying uh, in that regard. I don't see any prayer requests that have come in online, but we're praying for different ones. And uh, we want to be continuing to pray. We were praying for Penny Tro's husband, Rick, for his brother, but I, he passed. And so we just want to be praying for God's comfort for them. Frank. Yes. Uh, I don't have a prayer request, but very quickly I want to share some encouraging words about sharing Jesus in these times. The food places, the gas places, the Lord, people are nervous. Yeah. But the outside is, it makes me want to cry. It's so much easier to connect with a person's soul. Look in their eyes. Quote from John 3, 16. This, I went to Carl shoes, and I saw an elderly man sitting in the chair, and I sat next to him and gave him a chance. He poured his heart out to me. And I finally I said, you know, what's your name? He says, Carl. I go, are you the owner of the store? He goes, yeah. The really? The store. Oh, wow. He poured his heart out. Wow. What he talked about was how blessed I am. What a beautiful life. But he's talking in past tense. Right. I had. I had that. So he finally he says, well, I'm comfortable with that. And when he said that, I quoted John 3, 16, and I whipped out the gospel of God. And right. And when I opened it, it, it opened right at chapter 3. And I said, there you go, Paul. That's what I quoted. I said, can I bend the, the, the tip of it yeah. for you. He saw me as please, please. And you gave it to and him. And he held me. He, he got his elderly hand and he pressed it. And I put it in his hand and he looked at me with this look of love and he said, I'm going to read this. Wow. wow. Fantastic. Great. You're right. This is a, it's always the truth that times of suffering provide times of opportunity. You are right. So hearts get soft. Thank you for that reminder. And I have about a hundred of those gospel of John's. I'll give them out like That's four. great. Super. It's a big help. Big Super. Help. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I'm sorry. I, no, not me. Hey, I'm thrilled that we're ending on that note. That's an exciting, that's a very exciting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let me just lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for this, what Frank has shared. Just this moment of him seeing a heart that was soft and being able to be there in the moment. You put him there. And, and to be sensitive to that life and to be able to put your word into those hands. Lord, we do ask, we pray for opportunities. Let us not be rushing through life. Let us see lives around us. 
and look for opportunities to be the salt of the earth. Lord, we lift up these prayer requests to you. We, we, as, as we've prayed for missionaries, we pray for the hearts of our church in humility. We pray for these petitions, Lord. For these names, meet these lives, Lord. Meet them. Let them, let them sense your attention on them and, and be ready to have you work in them. We commit our ministry to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for joining us online. Hey, Sunday, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. See you there.